Jimmy, really appreciate uh, coming on and helping out, you know, just to be able to, you know, reach across the nation and all you guys, thanks for coming on. Um, I think we got guys from all over. I see Chuck over there in a beanie must be, it's always cold. Chuck's always in a, a car freezing his butt off. And um, just a, a quick introduction of um, you know, Jimmy. I mean, he's been one of the, in my mind, you know, one of the best tile setters, you know, at, across the nation and doing it for many years. I think you said, you know, mid eighties, you know, starting to set tile and even, as a helper, as you're 12, 13 years old, kind of getting into and setting tiles. So someone who's been in the industry a long time, uh, a true word, uh, uh, essence of uh, an artist, you know, uh, in, inside the pool. And um, just to kind of a quick introduction and Jimmy, yeah, if you want to you know, introduce yourself and kind of give a little background of uh, what you do on a daily basis. Sure. Okay. So I'm Jimmy Reed. Uh, my, my company is Rock Solid Tile. We primarily do uh, glass tile swimming pools, other materials too, but mostly in, in and out of uh, water features, pools, spas, fountains, uh, stuff like that. So I've been doing um, involved in tile work since, uh, as you mentioned, since I was about 12 or 13 is when I started as a helper, you know, with the, with the, with the crew that lived across the street from us at the time. And that was, that was in the uh, early to mid seventies. So <clears throat> obviously I haven't been doing it nonstop full time since then, but that's when I got introduced to it and started working summers and weekends and, uh, you know, uh, helping the guys out there. And then eventually started, uh, you know, taking on my own projects and little jobs here and there <clears throat> and um but i've been doing it as a career since yeah i'd say about early 80s uh we got i got my license in 1991 um but i had been doing business um well before that you know it just got to the point where we were working uh, more and more with contractors and so we had to get more legitimate at the time so which we did yeah and so i mean as a talent star so you're mostly dealing with now a lot of the high-end stuff where you're doing just all tile pools every you know i mean you're doing a lot I mean, you do yeah trim stuff and stuff but your kind of niche is created an all tile pool high-end market yes um I guess, I mean, just to kind of yeah, kick it off and get started, I have a few questions. Obviously, I could probably, we can sit here for hours out of all the questions I have, but I'll try to, you know, limit to them as much as possible. But for one of the questions I have, and a lot of pictures that I've seen, if you guys haven't seen Jimmy's work on Instagram or uh, Facebook, go look it up with Rock Style Tile. It does a lot of really good stuff. And as guys in the industry, and, you know, it's really awesome things to see that we can really appreciate because we know what goes into it. Um, and one of the things I kind of noticed, you know, looking at some of your pictures too, is, you know, you've done some where the pool is, you know, square, where it's all squared off, where the, mm -hmm. the floor and the wall meets is a, a sharp corner. And uh -huh. then others were radius uh -huh. as a tile installer for builders, us, we can set it up better. What do, what would you prefer if you're doing an all tile pool to have a, a straight corner or a radius? Well, it, it depends on the project and really the designer's, you know, vision. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the projects we work on are design driven uh, with, with, you know, legitimate waterscape designers. And they're very particular about everything down to the transitions through floor to, uh, floor to wall transitions and stair details as well. So I don't have a preference. It just, to me, it just depends on the project. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then working with, you know, certain tiles, because I mean, I've seen you work with tiles that just, you know, fit in the, you know, on your pinky and, you know, bigger tiles. Uh -huh. When you're working with a, a bigger format project, I mean, is it almost more beneficial to work with a smaller tile to, to work with the cuts and the grout lines and stuff like that? Or, well, again, it's that would be a design uh, factor as well. So it just depends on what the, you know, what, what is spec for the project. So mm -hmm. if we're doing a large format, like um, let's say a porcelain, we'll do a lot of glass, I mean, uh, sorry, black 
porcelain pools. Um, and so that's a little bit, the, the preparation isn't really different. Uh, well, even if we do occasional showers, we, our preparation is pretty much the same. So we're real detail oriented from, you know, whatever we're, whatever rough environment we're given out. So, mm -hmm. um, but with installing larger format, there's a little bit of, um, I guess a little bit of forgiveness in it because you, um, how do I say? There's there's different layout uh, challenges with larger material, but you're not always going to end up in a perfect. Uh, if you're working with say 24 inch material, you're not always going to end up with full pieces at each end. So it's not as critical that way. So we'll if we have a square transition pool that we're doing large format, we'll just float it as tight as possible and then install it. If we're doing a mosaic material, then it's a little more critical in the layout. So we eliminate all cuts basically, unless there's a radius or something. Gotcha. So all cuts at transitions are, there are no cuts at transitions. So we can, we're able to float out and prepare and lay it out to a, the full grid of the material. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, brings me to another point is as a, as a builder and, you know, to set up a tile guy, what in you in the in the past what can a builder do to set up the steel shotcrete everything to kind of help set you up so that you're laying it out correctly you're not having to correct certain things simple little things that maybe are kind of forgotten because yeah i mean that's the industry across the board everyone's worried about what they're doing they're not really necessarily worried about the next guy down the line mm -hmm. um as a yes. it, yeah, as a shock creep, uh, what, uh, what, what kind of things have you seen uh, that help you out? Um, what I've seen, well, it's always helpful for me personally to be involved with the project as early as possible. So sometimes I'll even go with builders pre-dig if, if, if we're on board that early, just to get a sense of the project, the scope of the, the, scope of the project and the sense of the environment and and what's going on on the project. And I like to meet the people that are involved in the project earlier on. So by the time we're actually on site consistently, we already have a relationship with, if it's a new general, let's say, you know? And, um, but um, I think the most critical, I mean, digging and steel, steel is, steel is important, especially you mentioned a square transition or a radius. So steel, obviously that would be critical. Um, <coughs> The most important uh, sub before us would be concrete. Um, and if we're doing a, again, if we're doing a square transition pool, usually usually it's either one depth or right. uh, there, depth for a while and then a pitch down to another elevation. Like it did. Um, hey, uh, Anthony, could you please mute your phone? Sorry, go ahead. Um, so <clears throat> those kind of surfaces are pretty critical. So I like to get in there with the general because I the the steel and the concrete guys they don't work for me, and they're certainly not going to listen to you know this guy that's you know they don't know that's trying to tell them how to make sure you <laughs> make sure those corners are clean and make sure your floors are are level and smooth. But um, so I'll do that with the pool builder that usually is the one that's hiring all the subs, you know, unless a general is hiring, but whoever it is, I'll get, I'll try to get on board earlier, as early as possible with the team and um, especially get in with the concrete crew and uh, be real aware of the surface that they're gonna leave with and make them aware that number one, a lot of times they don't even know what's gonna happen after them. So if it's a plaster pool, if it's a free form, you know, big cove radiuses uh, pool, and it's going to be plaster. It's not that critical. They can get in there and, and get in and out as quick as possible. But when it's a tile pool and a, a modern geometric a square transition flat floor kind of thing, it's critical that the when they're pulling their mud that they don't that they're not out two or three inches because that means we have to float two or three inches and we we really prepare and are set up to do. Hey, uh... Hey, Steve, could you please mute your phone? Steve C. I'm sorry. I thought. Um, 
so I, I was saying with the concrete, it's that I think that's the most critical um, uh, sub to deal with before we get there, or we, we get involved with uh, working on the project. Mm -hmm. And then, so I mean, speaking of that, because of concrete, so there's you know different types. I mean, I know we deal a lot with shotcrete here uh, in, in California, and you know, guys in Texas, they're doing gunite. But I mean, have you? worked with gunite and shotcrete? I mean, yeah, what kind of- we work with all kinds of, of uh, concrete. So gunite, shotcrete, even poured in place, uh, uh, pumped in, it doesn't really matter because yeah. me meaning the, the process that that material gets there doesn't make much difference to us. Okay, that's just, kind of my question. Is, is there a different prep for- We want the surface to be appropriate for us to move forward. Okay. So I don't care if it's wet or dry shot, it doesn't really and then I guess it's something that I've always been, I guess, didn't really know what the right answer was or how much you can go with is when we're dealing with stuff in the field and we have maybe a, a deco tile or a mosaic where you're trying to get this to lay out nicely, mm -hmm. how much from your standpoint, because there's always industry standard, there's premier standard, and then there's, I guess now what I call Jimmy Reed standard. <sighs> What, uh, how much are you willing to go with that grout joint to kind of make up some space? I mean, or, or do you try to keep everything uniform for a size grout joint if you're kind of working with, maybe I need to gain an inch in a 10 foot span? Do oh, yes. we. Well, again, we usually are there early on and when we are doing our preparation, we kind of sculpt the pool to what we ultimately need. So we're looking ahead, you know, four or five steps ahead. So we will know what the material, what, how the layout is going to be. So we're never going to have that um, much variation in, since you mentioned grout joints. I mean, the grout joints, it depends on the material, of course, but they want to be consistent, whatever they are. If they're eighth inch, you want to have them pretty consistently eight in, eighth of an inch throughout the project. Okay. Um, What's yeah. the thickest grout joint you've ever done, or would you never want to go above? Like when you oh, train your guys, I mean, train new guys. Depends on the on the project, also in pools, you know, especially if we're doing mosaic, you, it's a pretty tight joint. It's usually a sixteenth of an of an inch, approximately. But you know, if we're doing like Mexican pavers or some handmade, you know, Malibu tile type bathrooms or something, the the number one, the joints are going to be bigger just by design. And number two, if it's an inconsistent material, then the joints are going to vary. So you use, um, when you're getting into using spacers and things, the spacers are really a, a, just a guide, the, the joint, the uh, grout joint spacers. So you use those as a guide, but then we always kind of, in fact, we're doing a project now, it's a Malibu, Malibu Ceramic Works uh, fountain in a courtyard in Los Feliz, California. There's probably 20 different decorative tile pieces on this one little fountain. I think it's maybe 11 feet by six and a half feet wide. So there's quite a bit of ma different materials, all different shapes and sizes, uh, different thicknesses also. And each material, each, uh, each one of the tiles was designed with a different grout joint. Some of it's come with, some of it is coming with a uh, plastic face some, excuse me, some of it is coming uh, just loose in boxes. So we're just kind of compiling all this material and we will eventually set it, we're floating now. It's gonna take us about a week to float this one tiny little fountain. Four guys a week straight to calculate layout and float this little fountain. So all of our pieces fit together like a, a pieces of a puzzle, mm -hmm. which is basically what it is. So, but the, um, there are some rectangular pieces and we will be using spacers, grout joint spacers for those. Um, but we will install the spacers, then step back and then kind of manipulate each piece, much like we do with glass tile and pools. You, you know, after you pull the paper, uh, you adjust the pieces while the, the setting material is still wet. So mm -hmm. you eliminate all the obvious uh, sheet marks and basically blend everything together so it looks like it's one continuous application which is the same thing we have to do with this project i'm talking about now 
Gotcha. And then so, so to get back basically really to your question is we we will use spacers and depending on the project it will dictate the thickness of the joints. Um, but uh, it's also by eye. I mean, I'll always step back and make sure it looks good as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so kind of, I mean, you brought up a point or, you know, with the paper face uh, tile and everything and being able to manipulate it. So at what point uh, are you telling your guys that when you're doing the paper face tile and peeling, are you peeling it off and manipulating it or are you manipulating the tile with the paper on there? No, or, no, uh, no. What, how much it. time are you elapsing? How much time are you elapsing from setting the tile to pulling that paper off? Uh, well, that would depend on the temperature. So, um, but you, you know, within anywhere from 30 minutes to maybe a couple of hours, you know, if it's chilly out and humid or whatever, or, you know, it had, if it had rained recently, then it's going to take a lot longer for the installation material to set up enough that we can pull the paper. Gotcha. Well, so we the don't... timing on that is just kind of random. You just, you yeah. Well, I mean, we don't deal with rain in Southern California. I don't, I mean, yeah. or on your <laughs> job, you can base it over it. <laughs> yeah. So we're doing a project now in, um, here in LA, a large pool and it's tented, mm -hmm. uh, but it did rain. And even, even though it's tented, it rained a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it made a big difference in our timing on the inside of the tent, because just because it was cooler and a lot more moisture in the air. Well, and it also keeps a more constant temperature, right? I mean, because when you're dealing with glass tiles and that type of material, you want that temperature to stay pretty constant, right? Yeah, this time of year here, we didn't opt for uh, heating or cooling. Oftentimes we do if it's middle of summer, um, we'll definitely have to have air conditioning in the tent. Um, mm -hmm. But right now we don't need that before, you know, we're well before the summer uh, and it's, it's been pretty mild weather, you know, except for a couple of, uh, couple of rain uh, storms, but mm -hmm. nothing that lasted too long. So temperature wise, we haven't fluctuated that much that I would be concerned about. Gotcha. And then um, another kind of question before, I mean, I'll, I'll open up to some other questions if anyone else has any stuff is, I mean, a, a big one is infinity edges, right? So you're dealing with a lot of infinity edges and have dealt with a lot over the years. Uh -huh. And you want to, I mean, yeah, you want, while it doesn't lie, you want to nail it as, as best as possible. And mm -hmm. as the tiles have evolved over the years, some of them are translucent. You want to be able to stick that tile on an infinity edge and be able to cover the entire back of it with that thin set. So you don't have those air voids and stuff like that. Hey, uh, sure. Porter, can you uh, mute your phone? Um, Somebody's feeding you. Uh, so when you um, do your infinity edge with maybe those you know, one by one tiles and stuff like that, what's, a, I mean, what's something that you're kind of doing to help um, manipulate those uh, tiles uh, to get a nice, perfect straight edge? Well, that is that goes back to the preparation and the layout. So all of our floating is is really pretty precise. We're using transits and, and different levels and cross checking each tool that we're using each each instrument like that. So we'll use sometimes we'll have two transits on a job, uh, you know, lasers and uh, and lasers and also all kinds of uh, spirit levels. And we're constantly revolving using one here and using another over here and then crossing them just to make sure one of our tools isn't out. Mm -hmm. um, so the float is critical. So the, the float is really already going to be quite perfect by the time we, as I mentioned earlier, we're basically sculpting the environment in order for us to be able to put on the uh, finished material, the glass tile usually. So much like, you know, I, I I end up using cars as analogies a lot of times. So in this case, it's like body work. You know, the more time a body shop is going to spend on really getting the body perfect, the paint's going to go on really nicely after that. So it's, it's to me, it's, I wouldn't say all in the preparation, but it, the preparation is super critical. So that infinity edge, by the time we're ready to set tile on it, that infinity edge is perfect. Not to say that we're not checking the tile as well, 
um, which we are. So, uh, but the preparation is key. So if, if we're loose and sloppy in the preparation and the float, then the edge is going to be messed up. Yeah. So when you're doing a long infinity edge, uh -huh. about how often are you kind of, you know, setting your, your level? I mean, well, usually we'll use we'll use a transit every foot or so and we'll take you know six or eight foot levels and and measure and uh you know calculate those uh sometimes we'll use water levels you know the water hose levels and but again we're we're constantly uh, cross checking each instrument we use but as far as distance um we'll we'll use a transit every foot or so Okay. in float and in installation. Yeah, so in the installation, uh, when we're installing tile on, a, on an infinity edge, or at least a straight infinity edge, um, we'll do that. We'll go through all those steps in the float, and then put, we can put, the, put a level on or a straight edge, a leveled out straight edge, and know that our material is going up to touch, for an example, touch the bottom of that straight edge, and we know that's dead, dead level with zero tolerance. Um, and so I know we had talked earlier about paper face and I know there's a lot of debate going around and everything, but I mean, so with the mesh back tile, what's the debate? Well, I guess, I mean, uh, there's people saying that they can make anything stick, but, um, I mean, would would you, I mean, I wouldn't feel comfortable, but do you feel comfortable with mesh back tile at all or in pool? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I haven't found a mesh backed material that I've been number one comfortable with or even happy with. Mm -hmm. So uh, there may be some out there, but typically it's it's not geared for the type of installations that we do. I mean, it may be fine for a kitchen splash or you know a tub surround or something like that, but mm -hmm. for what we do, um, there's no reason to compromise like that. Yeah, I mean. So even if it's, uh, cause I mean, other people said it's fine underneath the water, but if it's out of the water, it's going to get too much of a, you know, temperature change. There's, there's no, there's no one answer for that because there are so mm -hmm. many manufacturers and there's so many components True. and materials that they use to apply the mesh to the back of the tile. So many different materials they use to make the mesh. Some is appropriate, some isn't. Some of the glue is appropriate, some isn't, who knows? And at that point, you're really only bonding to whatever glue they're using to hold <laughs> the mesh yeah. to the tile. So no. if, their fail, if their glue fails from their glass, that's on the installer, yet we haven't even touched the back of that glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I kind of do, do like that answer. You know, there's a debate on it, but your answer is, what's the debate? <laughs> yeah, I just, we, again, for, for my preference, we just try to stay away from that. Mm -hmm. we do stay away from that. Yeah, because I mean, to your Stay clear translucent also. I mean, um, there's a lot of materials, a lot of really pretty material, but being translucent, there are a lot of issues that can arise from that that aren't really, can't really be considered uh, failures, at least on the installers end or even the installation material. Uh, manufacturers in, but yet there can be some discoloration under the glass that is visible where it wouldn't be with a solid through body material. Yeah. And to your so, point, I mean, that glue, who's to say that glue doesn't yellow over time or cause problems. And then you as an installer are relying on a manufacturer's glue because yeah, that tile pops off that thin set might be grabbing onto that mesh and not letting well, go. That's, but that's my point. We may yeah. even using epoxy or whatever the installation material may be. We're only bonding to the back of their material. Mm -hmm. That mesh may be locked solid into the thin set, but if the mm -hmm. mesh is not connected to the glass appropriately, then it's- Have you, have you dealt with um, sticker back tile? Sticker back? I'm not, I don't know what that is. Reed, do you want to clarify on that? No, you're muted. You're off. It's um, it's where they um, I don't know. They have like a pattern that they like glue to, or I don't know if it's glue or fused to the back of the glass. Um, I don't know. I can go grab one from the yeah. Show. Basically, uh, it's a see-through translucent tile, and then there's a, a basically a pattern that's glued to the back of it to create almost like a where you can see the pattern 
through the tile. Mm -hmm. And so like, like a painted glass tile, except with design. Yeah, with a design behind it. Yeah. So basically, so, there's, there's a plastic a base. It has a plastic base to it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm number one, I'm not familiar with that, but I guess that would depend on whoever's making it. Number one, or do they approve it? Is it okay? Do they consider it okay to be used in a submerged application? And if so, what is the sticker, I guess you're calling it a sticker. What is that made of? And what are, what are we supposed to install that with, you know? Well, so, and then also, I guess- I, I'm, Honestly, I'm not familiar with that, so. Mm -hmm. And then just going through, if I guess it, if it passes the, the test, I mean, going through all the testing that's pool rated, I mean, if it's pool rated, I mean, or, or, or do you even take your standards higher than that if it's if it does get approval approved? I try to take it a little higher, but we don't really use that many different materials. So basically, we're sticking with Pizzazza or Oceanside, or sometimes we'll use light streams or or Sechis. Basically, those are the main four that we uh, use. They're we're most familiar with those. We've used all four of those manufacturers for many, many years. And they're also, I think, probably the most um, reliable as far as uh, manufacturer support for, at least for us. So there's a lot of materials out there that I wouldn't know the name. I wouldn't know who to call if we had a question or an issue. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like anything you get used to and familiar with a certain uh, certain product or whatever it may be. And you, that's just kind of what you know. Yeah. And uh, Reed pulled one of our tiles from our showroom. It's basically, this is kind of what it looks like. If you can see Reed's screen. Uh -huh. yeah, so, so this is a dot mounted um, from MPT. And uh -huh. um, so it actually that's has- stick, That's what you're calling sticker on the back? Uh, yeah, exactly. It has like a pattern and I'll peel mm -hmm. one off of here so you can kind of see it. But okay. I think you mostly use Bazooza tile. Is that right? Bazaza. Yes. Bazaza. Bazaza. Okay. And Laticrete? We use Laticrete often. We also use Lidacol often. Okay. That's and like whatever me. project we're doing, we stick with one manufacturer for the insulation material, meaning from the shell out, we use uh, one, one manufacturer. What is that? Yeah. So it's kind of has like a, you know, so it's got the clear glass uh, and then like, yeah. So I, I mean, that's the same thing with any back mounted material. I mean, it's basically paint or sticker on the back and I don't know how it's bonded or fused to that glass. If it'll hold up underwater or not, or under, yeah. you know, pressure underwater or not. I have no idea. I think um, that, let me see the back of that again, or the side. Yeah, that, that looks like something um, a friend of mine in Florida just did a pool with. His name is Jeff Ampey. You know, Jeff? Never okay. heard of him. Yeah, he's, a, he's an installer down in Florida. He's doing some pretty interesting work. I believe he just did a project with that same material that you just showed me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, I mean, so you said you like to use the same manufacturer from the shell out. Yeah, Does that so, include, include grout or? In, yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. So as you mentioned, laticrete. So let's say we're doing a, a pool and we're using laticrete. Uh, and a lot of times the project that we work on, all the installation system is specced by the, by the um, waterscape designer or architect. So if, it, if it's a ladder creek system, then we'll use 3701. We'll use 254 thin set to bond the float to the shell. We we'll use 254 uh, to install the material. We'll use a hydrogram uh, antifracture waterproof membrane, and we'll use whatever grout, if it's a cementitious or a, an epoxy grout that they expect, or, or we may use an epoxy, the lad epoxy 300. My point is, we'll use Laticrete if it's spec like that, or if we choose to use Laticrete system for a particular project, we use the same material, the same manufacturer's materials, all their components from the shell out. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, no, that definitely makes sense because then no- The only other um, product that we use often and I try to use on all of our projects is the um, Acuron CPSP. 
and that's a, a collodial silicate spray on. So it, it treats and helps uh, cure the concrete and helps strengthen it and so forth. Um, that is made specifically by, the one we use is made specifically by Acuron. And so that would be the only other component, regardless of what installation system we're using, that would be the only other component that we use is the Acuron. Uh, and, what, and so that's just basically to help the concrete cure so that you can get in there quicker no, or no not to no because it, it doesn't really matter because we, when we're on a project we're there for usually months at a time so there's a lot of curing going on while we're there um, and we're we're light compared to the weight of uh, you know a full pool of water so we can get into a shell while it's relatively green um, before it's technically cured um, the, real, the issue with curing or the importance of curing a pool shell is because basically because of the weight of the water that goes into it. So it's got to breathe and cure properly in, uh, uh, in the dedicated, dictated amount of time, which is usually a minimum of 28 days, as far as I know. Um, but we can get in there before that and start our preparation if necessary, if we're being pushed for whatever reason. And, but that won't uh, affect the curing of the material and it won't put any unnecessary uh, uh, weight on the shell while it's curing. Mm -hmm. And so that Akron, put, you can put that on before, yeah, I guess the recommended 28 days. Yeah, Are actually, you... the sooner the better. Yeah, that, that is, uh, the, the sooner that goes on, the more beneficial it is. So if, if they're shooting one day and they can pull their forms and if their forms are, or if it's open, uh, the next day is ideal. Install that. Do you I know there are other companies that, that make this uh, similar products. That just happens to be the company that we use. That we're do you on. acid wash prior to applying the Acron or uh, no, no. We'll pressure wash, but not acid wash. Just pressure wash it, clean it up, pump if it out. I mean, if, do, the pool it is, if the pool's been sitting, we'll definitely wash it out. If it's the next day, there's no real need. We'll sweep it up if there's any loose debris, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, but not acid. Does, does it need to have a little bit of moisture? Do you need to kind of maybe wet it down a little bit or? Yeah, yeah, if it's, if it's a dry shell, yeah, we'll mist it off and kind of kind of prime the concrete a little bit so it doesn't just flash dry. Because if you put it on and it's too dry, it'll just flash and it won't do its thing. So yeah, it needs mm -hmm. to be really cool and, and moist. So for the guys who are not, uh, I guess, um, acquired with Acron, I mean, what, what benefits as a builder, as a tile setter, what benefits does Acheron give you? I, it, it, I look at it as pretty inexpensive insurance. Um, it helps, as I said, it helps cure the concrete. It helps strengthen the concrete. It gives us, um, technically it's, it's giving us a little bit better bite as well, like for the thin set to bite to on, on the shell. Um, if you are, if anybody out there is interested in learning about it, or just getting some info on that, I would suggest to call um, uh, Paul, Paul at Acuron, and I can uh, I would be happy to share his number. He's super technical, super nice guy, and he's I, I just love talking to him because it's I can have a ten minute or twenty or thirty minute conversation with him and just go away learning so much every time. Yeah, just about yeah, shoot, shoot me his number and I'll share it on our our uh, Slack channel so that everyone um, has access to it. Um, yeah, that would be very helpful. Um, another thing is, so, I mean, yeah, you're doing that on the interior of it. Are you, is it necessary to treat the exterior walls? like well, raised it, walls? it penetrates up to, up to six inches, so it helps protect the steel as well. Um, but we'll do anything that's exposed that we can, like we'll do the top of the bond beam. Uh, we'll do, if it's a raised pool, we'll do the, anything that's, that we can access with the sprayer, then we will shoot, yeah inside cover vaults, okay. so anything concrete, yeah. Awesome. Um, Can I ask you a quick, quick question on that? Sure. Um, so Zypex would be like a similar crystalline technology, right? Like a- I think it's, uh, I think Zypex is quite a bit different actually. Oh, is it? Maybe the, um, maybe looking for the same result though. Yeah, I mean, isn't because I know Zypex, you just throw it in the truck and then, you know, the crystals grow inside the shop creek. Yeah, it goes into the mix, I believe. And I'm not real familiar with it, but I, I, I think it does go into the mix. 
yeah, that way you don't have to worry about spraying one side or the other, or, you know, mm -hmm. it all gets kind of mixed in. Um, and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, just one. I don't know what the cost is on that or what the pros and cons are compared to other types of applied materials. Um, but I've, yeah, I'm just not that familiar with it to say. Well, with, with the Aquaron, I, and I don't know that we've ever used that, Blake would have to tell me, but um, with the Aquaron or any kind of topical or whatever, um, where you're wanting it to soak in, don't you have to be careful on how much you let pool up on the surface too? Like, oh yeah. I mean, I've always been afraid of. Definitely. Yeah. You don't want it to pool up. It cannot pool up. So there's a definite way, proper way to apply it and the right uh, uh, tools to apply it as well. So we've been to uh, training courses. We're certified applicators of the product. Um, it is specific what nozzles you use. Use airless sprayers for this product. Specific what nozzles you use per surface. In other words, shot creek is a little bit different than gunite, the, uh, the nozzle that you use. But yeah, this is a specific way to install as well. Don't want it to pull out for sure. Awesome. And, it, and it sounded like you also had a, on top of that, you're doing like your mortar bed and then you're waterproofing on top of that as well? Correct. Okay. Yep. So you're using Acron as your, your kind of pre- a, That's our concrete treatment, yeah. Treatment, okay. It, it, so that I mean, helps protect the concrete. Have you used um, basecrete or uh, that process, the spray on? Uh, I haven't personally. I have uh, some friends that do that use basecrete often and it's their, their, um, their, I forgot the name of their material, but they have a very similar product and I believe works as well and probably just the same. Mirror coat? Uh, no, I mean basecrete. Oh, basecrete. Yeah, basecrete. Base it's called basecrete, the spray on one. And then their second version that goes on top of the mortar bed is called basecrete plus. Plus, yeah. Yeah, um, there and there are when when we get into uh, when we're asked to do waterproof membranes like uh, membrane C, the Miracle product or Base Street product, we will e either sub it out or have them have the general or pool builder hire a specific waterproof specialist for that. So we don't uh, because we're not we're not um, experienced with it. Number one. You think, oh, it's not that hard to put on uh, a waterproof membrane, but there are certain things that you need to know about it and, and experience helps with that. And you want the support of the manufacturer. And there are specific people that that's all they do is waterproofing and, and applying these membranes. So mm -hmm. I would rather have somebody like that do it than take on the liability myself um, for something I'm not familiar with. And I don't want to take work away from the guy that's, you know, gone to school and done all the research. I'm not a handyman. Yeah. And I think one important thing about it too is like we have a rooftop pool coming up where it's only got six inches of shot creek. And I think that like on something like that, like you can really screw that up. You know, that's why I, I made sure. Yeah, that, I, you know, I would imagine that has a, I would imagine that has a pan under it or some type of real uh, protection below the concrete. Yeah, it's still and scary. Me, definitely, you would want to apply as much uh, as many uh, layers. I guess as many layers or just yeah. Uh, but I, but I think one thing that's important because you're talking about tile is that tile is not like all the grout joints that are that come with tile. You're going to get some leaks going through that grout, and so it's sure. really important to have. I mean, water. I wouldn't consider it leaks, but water migrates through grout. I mean, I, that is absolutely not a waterproof or to be considered any, any in, by any means, a waterproof component. Yeah. Yeah. The grout, the thin set, the tile itself. And those then, are not so one question now, because yeah, I mean, you said you do mostly all tile pools, but then also you're working in pools that will be taking plaster as well. How does that product take the, I mean, does it affect uh, applying plaster on top of it? Do you try not the, to put uh, it in it? The Acuron product? Yeah. It's it's actually um, like the thin set application on top. It's it's perfect. It's excellent for plaster or any type of, of troweled on finish. 
Okay. So you're not trying to just specifically put it for tile areas. It's no, I recommend it to all of our pools. Okay. Whether we're doing, you know, a simple water line or the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, before I know we're getting closer, I don't want to take up any, does anyone else have any, you know, specific questions? I, I didn't, I, I didn't meet or hear from, I only heard from Reed. Uh, I didn't hear from anybody else. Well, I mean, some people have been asking stuff. So Mark uh, out in um, Charlotte. Where is he Mark? Questions. He's, uh, you can unmute yourself, Mark. Oh, sorry, Mark, you're right in the middle. There you are. <laughs> or are you still muted? Yes, yeah, sir. There you go. Um, yeah, I was just, I, I had some questions about, I had asked, uh, you know, if you're waterproofing your exposed walls on the exterior of the pool um, with the Acuron. I just, I mean, literally, last week started looking into this Acron. I've been trying to reach out to them and have not gotten any uh, um, call back from them yet, but. Yeah. Do you uh, call a, uh, a manufacturer's number? Manufacturer's number? Just, just what I found just online. Just what I found online. It's speeding so. back. It's speeding back. Uh, okay, just, uh, Blake, just, I'll get you, I'll get you their uh, direct line. I'll get you Paul's direct line. He's the rep for Acuron and he'll pick up the phone and he'll be happy to talk to you. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'll get that directly over to you and Mark. So Mark. That, uh, okay. And then I guess, I know he touched on it, but I just had one other question about the actual waterproofing at the, so take away a whole glass pool theory, but let's just talk about that six inch water line. If you were doing glass, like especially here in Charlotte, we avoid glass bad because we get enough frost freeze where it can cause a lot of problems. Uh -huh. um, I know there's ways to probably prep the pool correctly where it wouldn't be a problem, but here it's pretty much known that if you do glass and it's not done exactly right, you will have a lot of problems. And that might be nationwide. It, it can um, be, it, you can have problems even if it is done right. I mean, don't think that we get away with uh, zero issues because we have plenty of issues, but you know, that's to me, it's just part of our, we just have to deal with it. Yeah. So, so um, I guess my question is, uh, you mentioned base creep and a couple other things that I wasn't all that familiar with, but when it, the, the stuff that a lot of builders here are using is, is a roll on, like basically it looks like extremely thick paint and for lack of a better description, you know, go east and west with it and then north and south on your second coat um, at that waterline tile. But to me, it seems like the moisture from the back side of the pool, especially on the walls, is getting into that through the back. For sure. Uh, yeah. So do you recommend waterproofing the entire beam and all exposed walls? Well, it, I mean, it depends on the area, really. Um, if you have access to the back of the beam, then I, I would waterproof. I, and the top I of said the beam. I'll try to apply, I'll try to act, treat every inch of area that we have access to. With the Acron, but I'm talking about like the um, water like roll on membrane. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know which products those are. Um, again, we usually sub it out. Um, but yeah, if there's, if you're on a water table and you're putting a membrane on that doesn't breathe, there's absolutely an opportunity for the, for that membrane to be, get delaminated from the back pressure. Hydrocyte yeah, and, and definitely, Mark, I mean, when you're dealing with anything that has a positive and negative, where positive being like a, maybe a raised beam with a planter or soil behind it up against a, a hillside, I mean, taking it a step further, when you're digging that pool to over dig a foot past the form so that guys can get back there and waterproof because, yeah, you're going to waterproof the face of it. But as simple as over digging a foot to get behind that to waterproof it, now you're waterproofing both sides. And then you have the positive and negative where anytime you have a positive and negative, you want to waterproof both sides. Raise spas, waterproof all the way down on the inside, all the way down to the bench, and then you know outside as well that you normally do. Because water is always going to want to creep through. I mean, as Jimmy said, I mean, grout no is water. not a waterproofing surface. And uh, it's definitely, yeah. Any, any surface that you can waterproof, absolutely waterproof. Um, let's see, Jonathan, you've been quiet. How are you doing out there in Texas? Reed ruined all my questions, but no, I was just- uh, <laughs> Where are you in Texas? 
we are just north of Houston, between uh, Houston and Austin. Okay. Uh, but I, I was, I was, my, my main question was what, uh, what thin set you're using. And I think you answered that with the Laticrete. Yeah. If, if, if we are using Laticrete system, then we'll use 254, uh, for cementitious or we'll use the epoxy. I know there's a, there's quite a different level. I think the Laticrete is the most popular one I've heard from, but is there anything that we need to make sure we stay away from? Or just as far just, as uh, manufacturers for material, um, yeah. I really wouldn't know what to stay away from. Because <laughs> that's all you've uh, ever used. Yeah. I mean, we've no. I mean, we've used um, uh, Mape. We used to use Mape a lot. They used to have a. Pro they may still have it. I don't know. But they they what we used to use was um, Carabond. I think was their thin set, and uh, Carelastic was the elastic additive. And we used to use that a lot before we uh, switched over to Laticrete, but that was a really good product. There were, there were more components that you had to mix together, um, uh, but that was a good, good, uh, good system. Um, I don't know much about custom building products as far as pool installations. Uh, I know the Red Guard membrane is not one that is, I think, recommended for pools, uh, so I would stay away from that, from what I hear. Um, but yeah, we, we have been long time uh, Laticrete users and we have a good relationship with them. Um, we also use a company called Lidacol um, as well as Laticrete. We've been experimenting with Lidacol for several years and they have some pretty specific and uh, revolutionary uh, products in their line. So you might want to check them out as well. Uh, that's, um, yeah, they're actually uh, an a Russian company made in Italy, I believe, and there's a manufacturer, there's a, uh, uh, a distributor in the States uh, called the Tile Doctor. So you could, if you're interested in checking that out, get a hold of Kurt Rapp at Tile Doctor. Now, are you, are you using a majority of epoxy on your, your stuff? Or are you doing We the try to use epoxy. Uh, again, if, if it's spec uh, that we have to use a thin set, then we'll use 254. I, I've never seen a thin set spec different than 254. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, one question I kind of had on, so when you're doing long infinity edge walls and, and heights and everything, and you're dealing with, you know, glass tiles and things that have that, you know, have the expansion about how many feet are you putting in you know, almost expansion or control joints? Um, well, the rule of thumb is eight to 12 feet. So that's what I would recommend for people that are doing all glass pools, especially if it's um, got some exterior areas like the back of infinity uh, edge walls. You know, mm -hmm. walls. And so that's only exterior. You're not doing that inside the pool. It's just well, it, exterior. It depends on the spec and it depends on the insulation system and the architect and what we can come up with. Um, like I say, the rule of thumb is every eight to 12 feet. So I would have to recommend that. Uh, but oftentimes we personally don't do that. Um, depending again on the, you know, we'll come up with a specific system and a specific way to get a, around it. Uh, and with everybody being on, everybody involved being on board, the general, the owners, the, the owner's reps, the manufacturers of whatever materials we're using. It's a, definitely a conversation that needs to be had and, uh, understood by everybody involved if you're going to deviate from that, which we yeah. do often. Also, the insides of pools are generally, at least out here, they're generally controlled environments, meaning they don't fluctuate in temperature all that much. So there's not going to be a whole lot of movement uh, as a result of expansion and construction inside a pool mm -hmm. in our area. Yeah, I mean, and then so when you have done those controlled drawings, what type of um, silicone or control joint are you using to again depending on the system we're using if we're using laticrete we'll use the laticel their their silicone uh, mm -hmm. material and they have I think if they have if they have 50 grout colors I think they have 45 of them matched to their caulking okay and then I think another question we had uh, come up I don't read do you want to ask <laughs> Well, actually, on that. Did you type me a question? Yeah, I did. But real quick, on that last one, the Laticil, uh -huh. um, 
we had a we had a problem where the grout color and the silicone color once it looked great until the water got on it and then yeah, totally the water, yeah. so the lattice is going to be matching close to the grout samples and it will match underwater to the epoxy grout but yeah any cementitious grout underwater is going to be it's going to look darker yeah so, so and customers not just with the silicone not, not not just because of the silicone that you need to be aware of this or bring this to the attention of the owners because a lot of times people will pick a grout color just for the color itself and then in the pool it's darker and you know unsuspecting owners are kind of scratching their head like that's not that's not that's not the same as this sample that you showed me yep yep yeah okay i have uh i'm going to try to squeeze two more questions out of you one of them how do you I, I have I have a few more minutes, so I'm okay. Okay. If you're good. looking to get out because of me, I'm okay right now. How do you bid out jobs when you spend so much time with your prep and with laying the tile and everything? I mean, I've seen like your pictures of you guys working on pools. You might get like 10 square feet done in a whole day. Like it's crazy how slow the process is. Yeah. How do you bid that and make money? Well, the process is um pretty intense. And yeah, most, like I mentioned before with the body work on a, you know, on a fine automobile, a lot goes into the preparation. So what we could spend, if we're on a job for, let's say three months, a good 60 or 70% of that time is in the preparation. And then by the time the, in a, in a paint booth, by the time the paint's ready to go on, it's just going to fly on. By the time we're ready to install our tile, we can fly. So um, yeah, so it's, there's a lot of work and time involved in the preparation. So um, I mean, I bid it per, I mean, I have to look if, if I have just a rectangle pool with square transitions and a, a little tiny little wedding cake entry uh, with no infinity edge, um, that is going to be a different price point than you know, full perimeter with all kinds of benches and lounges and steps and crazy shit going on in it. So it just depends on the project itself. But I know how to bid. I mean, I've done it once or twice. I've done it for at least a week or two. Um, so I can usually bid it at uh, a point where I'm comfortable. And I think usually the clients that we are awarded jobs from are see the value in what we have to offer. And well, I think you're the most highly sought after pool tile person in the whole world. I mean, so wow. it's really cool to have you here, first of all. So thank you very much. But um, like, I always wonder when I see your pictures, I'm just like, how the heck do you bid these jobs? Like, yeah, obviously you're the best. So you're going to get the best, you know, money for your um, whatever. You're the best value. So well, I think that's that that is accurate. It's a it's a really good value. It may be more than most than some people are um, used to, or maybe surprised by what the numbers sound like. But there's a lot that goes into it. Not just from my experience and what it's cost me to get to this point, but of course our materials are super expensive. Our labor is expensive. I mean, we don't go and hire guys, new guys for every job. I have long-term employees that are very well taken care of and appreciated and that know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what I want and what I need to make that project perfect. Um, and at the end of the day, there is value to a lot of that. And we strive for, I can't say uh, that we're, 100% successful in this, but we definitely strive for um, no callbacks. So we want to give people the most unique. And I, I always say to every client, you're going to have the best pool in the world. And they do until, of course, until our next pool. But they, somebody along the way always has the best pool in the world. And, um, but, you know, a lot goes into our details. And I don't mean just our cool little corner details where, the, you know, you're seeing the glass wrap around something really cool. But the details, meaning from every step from that shell out, from that raw shell that we're given out. And a lot of times, like I said earlier, a lot of times I'm visiting the job site way before the, the shell is even shot. So there's a lot that goes into what we 
give at the end of the day, at the end of the project. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you mentioned, um, yeah, your cool little corner detail. I mean, that kind of brings me to, you know, the question is what types of tools are you using when you're making those intricate cuts? Um, if we're making cuts, we'll use, uh, you know, a variety of grinders with diamond blades and diamond bits and things. And uh, we use, uh, we use some, some tools that are, were designed uh, for the jewelry industry, you know, for, for fine uh, polishing and grinding and shaping uh, gemstones and things like that. You know, we kind of, and we make some, some interesting, we kind of have to fabricate our own tools sometimes. So um, awesome. it depends on the material and what we're doing. Yeah. But there's a variety of different, I mean, you, you just got to kind of come up with stuff as you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got Sweet. one one last question, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so <laughs> probably not like right now. You probably have a lot of employees coming to you right now, but in your past history of like hiring employees, hiring those guys that you're going to hang on to for a really long time, what is your uh, best strategy to find a guy that's going to care about what he does and and really care about it like you do? The strategy like, is they have to come from somebody that already works for us. So Explain I, that in other words, I don't, I don't put an ad in the paper or go online and try to find installers. All of our installers come from other installers that already work for us. And that's how it's always been for me anyway. So a lot of the, in fact, my top guy right now, I hired in I don't, well over 20 years ago and he was a helper. He came on as a helper, uh, and I think that was one of his first year in the business, you know, just being a helper, and uh, he came on and has stayed with us over the years, over 25 years. Yeah, he's been with us a long time, and um, he's learned everything that I need. So our pools, our guys, were, I mean, I don't want guys to know too much by the time they get to us because, you know, it's like, now they're going to have to break some habits. I want them to be a little green and open and be able to learn. I don't want to hire some top high-end uh, installers. I want to hire guys that are coming up and interested in learning. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. What about uh, this guy, Leroy D Travis? Leroy Travis. He's the only one. You're the only other one I see on the screen, but I haven't heard from you. That's a good, yeah, thank you. Uh, you got you're muted, Leroy. Yes, sir. I talked to Jonathan. I talked to Reed. Uh, obviously, Blake, and there was a couple. I think there were a couple other guys here. It looks like everyone's gone. But yeah, where are you from, Atlanta. Leroy? We're South Atlanta. Bob Gordon. You're in Atlanta. Uh, yes, South of Atlanta. Um, really don't have any questions. I think you've answered everything we needed to know okay. as far as. Uh, are you, you know, are you a builder? I am a construction manager. Yes, builder. Manager for a, a GC. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So everyone on this call is either uh, a construction manager, owner of a Premier Pools across the nation. So I think we're over 103, 102 offices now. Um, let's see who else uh, is on here. For Fernando, do you have any questions? Here's Ryan Neal. I see down here. I don't see Fernando. No, I think. Yeah, I, I got a question. Oh, there's uh, Fernando. <laughs> Fernando's driving. Yeah, uh, Ryan. So honestly, what are the three, um, I guess, characteristics that um, created your success? I mean, I hear you're the best, like preparedness. Um, what are three things that you really strive to do to be the best? Well, number one, I don't try to be the best. There are probably other people. I mean, what does that mean even? best. I mean, there are plenty of good installers out there. I can name a handful, you know, uh, on my, I, I could probably name five or six right now. Um, but I try to be, I am extremely honest. I'm confident. I feel I'm pretty confident when I go into a meeting or uh, onto a job, you know, interview. Um, we are diligent about our
process of preparation and uh, just being thorough in each step that it takes to get from, I keep saying the raw shell, from the raw shell to our finished, polished, cleaned up material, uh, glass pool. So it's just being, I guess it would be being extremely thorough and honest. So that's two things. No, that's excellent. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I appreciate yeah. the answer. I also like to be available um, to um, our clients. So there's a bit of transparency involved in that too. That I guess goes along with honesty, but um, I always will pick up the phone if I have the phone with me. And if not, I'll answer phone calls to clients or, or otherwise as soon as possible. I don't like to leave people hanging because I don't like to be left hanging. Exactly. Call somebody, I have a reason to call and I need an answer or or I just want to share some love with someone. I mean, I just, you know, it's got to be now though. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fernando, what's up? No, I was good. I was interested in the infinity edge part because I've got a pool that's going on with that right now. And uh -huh. mm -hmm. I heard the deal about two lasers or use as much as you can to make sure that top end is straight and float out the uh -huh. beam really good. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I heard. Other than um, other than that, I think that was it. Everything else was pretty great, but that was the part that I was interested in because uh, I'm working on one of those right now. Okay. Yeah, the infinity edges are probably uh, the areas that take the most abuse out of all the areas in a pool. So that will get wet and dry and it'll get hot and cold more than any other area. So it's pretty critical how you approach that. So do you think on that the grout edge needs to be at like at a 16th or does that matter anything? I mean, just because it's going to have a lot in change in temperature. What do you mean? The thickness of the grout joint? Correct. Well, it depends so on that. Dry up and shrink or expand and cause yeah. that tile to pop loose here and there if we're using like... Yeah, if, if, if there's, if you don't allow for any movement of the material, it definitely will pop. So yeah. we would, you would recommend a thicker grout line on that? I would recommend um, as much soft joint as possible, meaning meaning you know a, a silicone or something similar. Okay. Okay. So a lot of times we'll use, not a lot of times. Sometimes we'll use on that on that edge on that sharp knife edge. We'll use the uh, silicone in that entire joint. Oh wow! But the problem with silicone is it repels. So if you have a if you have a super clean installation and it's just perfect all the way, you obviously you want as little flow over it as possible, right? Uh, right. Just to keep it beautiful and serene. You don't want it flying off the edge. The silicone in that case, though, will kind of make the water beat up and kind of travel with it. Okay. Awesome. Well, I appreciate um, everyone's time and uh, I know we all kind of we try to carve an hour out of our busy schedules every other Thursday. And I really do appreciate everyone that's uh, jumped on the call uh, this week and uh, it's, you know, same time and same place in two weeks, guys. And uh, Jimmy, I, again, I just, you know, really grateful for being able to take out time in your, in your day to help uh, help the industry and help people um, just to share your knowledge and everything that you've been through. And it really is uh, something that, uh, we definitely appreciate, and we got that. Uh, yeah, is that uh, who, who who popped in for Jonathan? Just pop in, Jonathan's coming. Is that oh, is that Mike? Disregard that guy. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. <laughs> no <laughs> <man>. <laughs> Jimmy, coming on, man. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Oh, you, is, is he? Is Mike have to do more training, or is he in trouble? Uh, I I got to train him. Can, it's can a monthly it, basis. Can it be both? Gosh, <laughs> it could have been both. <laughs> Well, I'll, honestly, I love seeing you guys' faces. I know COVID's kind of starting to break loose here, so we're going to be able to see each other, you know, in person a little bit more as we get into our, you know, more gatherings and stuff like that. But definitely love seeing you guys come on and, you know, participate and just keep helping us, you know, grow from, from the bottom up and just keep making the industry better uh, within and outside uh, the company. So, again, appreciate your time, Jimmy. Forever Dayful, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, you guys. We'll see you Jimmy. Later. Yeah, you. much appreciated, Jimmy. I Thank see you. Now on the bottom. Uh, I didn't say hi. Have a great one.
Hey, Chuck. Uh, and then I see a blank space up here that says Bob Euchre, but I don't see his name. <laughs> yeah, see it. All right. Well, anyway, thank you guys for inviting me. I appreciate it. Um, happy to help or happy to share and get info from you guys as well. So thanks a lot. Thanks for including me. Thank you very thanks, much. guys. See you later, Jimmy. Thank well, you.